everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Forecasting and Trading with the Elliott Wave Principles. We are very fortunate to have presenting for us today Jeffrey Kennedy, Chief Commodity Analyst at Elliott Wave International. Welcome, Jeffrey. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Of course, and I'm Betty Smith. I'm the Vice President of Communications here at CQG, and we're thrilled to have all of you here for the presentation today. Before we get rolling, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you have any technical issues at all with the audio or with any aspect of the web conferencing, please use the chat feature. So when we're in the web conference view, that's on the right hand uh, in the middle. When we're in full screen view, you can just use the floating toolbar to send a chat message. Uh, please submit your questions at any time during Jeffrey's presentation, and you can do that using the Q&A feature in the web conference view. That's just at the bottom right hand of your screen. When we're in full screen view, uh, that's again on the floating toolbar. Jeffrey's going to do the entire presentation, and we'll handle questions at the end, and we'll take as many as we can uh, with the time that we have today. So, and as always, we will be recording the webinar, and that will be available uh, in a couple of days. So with that, I'd love to introduce Jeffrey Kennedy. He's a respected educator and author in the field of technical analysis, specializing in the Elliott Wave Principles. As I mentioned earlier, he's currently the Chief Commodity Analyst at Elliott Wave International, uh, as well as a lecturer at the Georgia Institute of Technology. So as I said, we're absolutely thrilled to have you here with us today, Jeffrey. And with that, I'm going to pass off the presentation to you. Excellent. Um, Betty, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And I would like to thank everyone who has uh, joined me today. <clears throat> um, I know everybody has a busy day. It's uh, still the middle of the week, and uh, markets just closed recently. Uh, so I know everybody's time is uh, valuable and precious. So I'm going to try and make the next 20 or 30 minutes as um, uh, useful and impactful as possible. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, basically, what we're going to be looking at today is forecasting and trading with the wave principle. And probably what a good place to start would be to explain what exactly is the uh, Elliott wave principle. And very simple, here's the answer. The wave principle is a form of technical analysis that is based on crowd psychology and pattern recognition. The wave principle was discovered by Ralph Nelson Elliott in the 1930s when he observed that crowd behavior trends and reverses in recognizable patterns, which he called waves. And he also understood the fractal nature of those patterns. And it was, I believe, in the 70s that the wave principle really became popularized by um, A.J. Frost and Robert Prechter. Okay, now, in the original literature of, of Ralph Nelson Elliott, um, what he did with the wave principle is he actually identified 13 patterns, <clears throat> um, various patterns like truncations and extensions and that sort of thing. Um, over the years, as a, as a practice in Elliott Hitchin, and I've been doing this for 20 years or counting waves for 20 years now, uh, what I try and do is simplify much of my work from being, say, analytical to more practical, more uh, trading-oriented, you could say. So what I've done essentially here uh, for today's uh, webinar, as well as for my own personal trading, my own personal analysis, is I've taken those 13 patterns and essentially boiled them down to what I consider to be five core Elliott wave patterns, and we're going to spend some time with each one of these briefly. Uh, number one, the impulse wave, the diagonal, the zigzag, the flat, and the triangle. Everything else, like for example, if you are familiar with the wave principle, you know what an expanded flat is. That simply is a, a variation of a flat structure here. So what we're going to go ahead and do next is look at each of the individual patterns here. And this is actually the impulse wave. Uh, this is uh, over here to the um, to the left hand side of the screen is an impulse wave in a bull market. As you can see here, we have a five wave structure, waves one, right here. I'm trying to use my pencil here, and then two, three, four and then we have wave five. So essentially what we have here is a five wave structure and what's important about those five wave moves is that it, it identifies the direction of the larger trend. What we have over here to the right of course is a five wave decline in a bear market. And again notice a few things about this pattern. Uh, wave four, 
does not end in the price territory of wave one. Wave two does not end beyond the origin of wave one. And wave three is not the shortest impulse wave of waves one, three, and five. All of these are very, very important with respect to the rules and guidelines of the wave principle. And to learn about those rules and guidelines, it's very simple. You can pick up uh, the Frost and Prechter book on the wave principle, I believe, at Amazon.com, or even come to the ElliottWave.com website, and you can learn a little bit more about the actual individual structures. But with respect to motive waves, and there are two types of motive waves, the impulse wave and the ending diagonal, which is what we're going to look at next. This is the ending diagonal. Now, some of you are familiar, who are familiar with Edwards and McGee's work, you'll understand understand that the ending diagonal could be referred to as a rising wedge. From an Elliott wave perspective, it's a very important pattern because it is referred to as a terminating wave pattern. We only find the ending diagonal in two wave positions, the fifth wave position of an impulse wave or the wave C position uh, of an ABC formation. <clears throat> so whenever we see this specific pattern, we tend to get excited because it, what it does is it signals the termination of the trend of essentially the next larger degree or the next larger pattern. So we're always on the lookout for a good quality ending diagonal. Next, what we have is the zigzag. Um, Elioticians refer to this pattern as a 5-3-5 pattern, and that's simply to denote that within, say, wave A here, we have five moves. One, two, right here, uh, wave three, wave four, and wave five. And then we have, of course, a three-wave move for wave B. And then we have another five-wave sell-off to the downside. This is why, again, Elioticians utilize the notation of uh, 535 to, uh, <clears throat> to uh, describe this pattern here. What we have over here to the right is a zigzag, a 535 pattern, but this isn't a bear market. <clears throat> uh, as you can see, this is a counter trend move to the upside. So from a trading perspective, I want to be looking to actually, say, sell the market over here, and over here, looking to actually buy the market. So that's how we, uh, number one, this explains how the wave patterns, though the specific wave patterns that R. N. Elliott identified, are useful to actually forecast upcoming price moves. Now, what I'm going to be doing after we examine a few price charts later on, toward the end of the today's presentation is show you how I actually trade with the wave principle because it's a very important distinction and it's something that a lot of people have a big problem with. So we're going to be trying to be dealing with that as well. <clears throat> Next, we have the flat. This is, of course, it's what we call a 335 pattern, and that's simply because wave A subdivides into three waves. Here's my one, two, three, or my ABC for wave A, ABC for wave B, and then, of course, we have our five wave decline in wave C. And then over to the right, we have a flat correction in a bear market. And that could, of course, say form in the wave two or the wave four, the wave B, or possibly even as an X wave if you have, a, say, a very complex correction. Next, let's go ahead and take a look at the final pattern, and that's simply a uh, contracting triangle. Uh, and again, this is a pattern most uh, everybody's familiar with from uh, reading uh, Edwards and McGee, uh, the uh, classic book. Uh, those chart patterns, again, f fit very, very nicely within the context of the wave principle. Now, what we're going to be looking at next <clears throat> are actually a few price charts that I've put together. Um, for myself, now two things you're going to be you're going to find two things very interesting. Uh, I am the chief commodity analyst at Elliott Wave International, so I spend uh, most of my time focusing on what soybeans and coffee and cocoa and lean hogs and the commodity markets are doing. But when it comes to my own personal trading, I tend to actually like to trade individual stocks. So all the price charts you're going to be looking or seeing today are going to be individual stocks because <clears throat> I tend to trade individual stocks and uh, I don't like to do uh, analysis uh, um, on markets that I tend to trade. I find that uh, <clears throat> your bias can somehow sometimes bleed into the equation. But in this instance here, uh, you'll see that these charts here are essentially handwritten. You know, like, for example, that's my arrow I drew with my pen on my desk, 
and I usually do these price charts on the weekend, uh, sometimes during the week, and I pass these out to friends and colleagues, you know, that sort of thing, who are interested in individual stocks or individual trade setups, that sort of thing. But these come from, again, my desk, and they're handwritten, so they're excuse the, the sloppiness. But I wanted to show you with respect to forecasting, how simple and how powerful the wave principle can actually be. Okay, for example, in this instance here, I'm simply beginning a move, beginning my wave count from this example right here, uh, simply going waves one, two, and then we have another one, two, three, four, five for three, pull back in four, and then up in five. Okay, well, this is five waves up. Uh, this is simply a five-wave move to the upside. Uh, that being the case, the next move I'm looking for is going to be to the downside. So I'm looking to actually t uh, acquire, say, take a short position at these areas. Well, as you can see, nice move to the downside uh, from what we from where we were looking at, which was originally 36.14. That initial drop here was actually a nice 15% drop in prices. Now, the reason I'm not measuring it all the way down to when I printed the price chart. There's, there's really no need. It's obvious what happened following this initial five-wave advance to the upside. Next, let's go ahead and take a look at another one. Again, simple pattern here. Uh, what I'm looking at, essentially, when I saw this price chart, is this move. One, two, three, A, B, C. Well, a three-wave move is a zigzag. In this instance, it is a zigzag. So essentially what I'm looking at here is, hey, a three-wave move is a counter-trend move. Uh, this could be a wave B. This could be a wave 2. Uh, either way, I'm looking down. I, I want to actually be looking to sell the market. And now someone may be looking at this price chart, what, but what about all this over here to the left? Uh, what's, what's the wave pattern that this fits? What's the, what's the labeling of everything that happened, say, from this point backward? Um, honestly, don't know, and honestly, don't care. What I'm looking for is a trading opportunity. What I'm looking for is a trading setup. And thus, one of the ways I actually find these, uh, those opportunities is by uh, looking for the core five Elliott wave patterns, impulse waves, ending diagonals, zigzags, flats, and triangles. Here, we have a three-wave move. I know it's going to come to the downside. And as you can see, Nice move to the downside, 19.55% uh, to the downside. This was an, actually a nice trade. Let's take a look at another one. Again, what I'm doing when I look through these price charts is I'm essentially looking for uh, wave patterns that I recognize, and it has to go back with the basic, uh, you know, the five core Elliott wave patterns, the, the zigzag, the flat, the triangle, the impulse wave. And in this instance here, what I'm essentially seeing is a nice five-wave decline, an impulsive move. Now, that move to the downside, that could be wave A. It could be wave 1. I don't know. But what I recognize is an impulsive move to the downside followed by something clearly corrective. I have an A, B, C to the upside. Thus, my focus is down. Very, very simple. Okay, let me clear that up. And as you can see what's happened, again, nice move. Here, the substructure is very clean, very, very clear. And in fact, one of the things I, uh, I do recommend whenever I do teach or, uh, um, it, it, with respect to the wave principle and how to employ it, and I think what I would refer to as a, uh, the proper uh, application, <clears throat> is when you're looking, for your, looking through price charts, looking for you know, trading opportunities, always begin asking yourself, is there a pattern you recognize? For example, in this slide here, I see a pattern I recognize. I see a nice impulsive move to the downside, followed by a three-wave move up. And again, this could be wave A, wave one, doesn't matter to me. I do know that I need one more move to the downside, one more selling opportunity. Whenever you ask yourself that question, do I see a pattern I recognize, I do recommend that that question be answered as quickly as possible. And when I say quickly as possible, I'm typically saying one second two seconds. Three seconds, it's too long. And the reason why is because if you don't see something you immediately recognize on a price chart, you'll tend to see exactly what you want to see. And that never ends pretty, trust me. Let's look at another one here. Um, 
This is uh, AKAM. This is a 240-minute price chart. Uh, I thought the labeling here of the substructure was very, very apparent. Um, the price gap right here, price gaps are important. Price gaps tend to occur in the wave three position uh, and actually very often in the wave three of three position. So in this instance here, I think this is a nice wave three of three indication. So what I'm essentially doing is simply counting this waves one, two, three, four, and five. Clearly you can see that. Those, again, these are my handwritten notes. And then here's my three-wave counter trend move to the upside. Counter trend price action tends to be contained by parallel lines. So I think this is a good shorting opportunity with you know this issue trading roughly around the 40 handle. And again, notice on the on the on the price chart. This is of course CQG. Uh, notice I don't have any indicators. I'm not looking at MACD or stochastics or RSI. I'm not looking at volume here. I'm, I'm just basically going with straightforward pattern recognition, and with respect to the pattern recognition I'm employing, it's the Elliott Wave patterns. And again, the, the basic five that we've already reviewed. And as you can see, when we were looking at the chart initially, we were looking at the 40 handle. This was, again, very nice position, a very nice trade. It was a 28.83% uh, decline in just a matter of weeks here. Okay, here's another one. Uh, and again, you can see that this comes right off my desk. Uh, this was, a, a, I thought, a nice five-wave move for wave one, nice three-wave move up for wave two, clean impulsive move down in wave three. Now, the subsequent price action here, I, I felt or believed it simply was a what we call a flat correction. Three waves in wave A, three waves in wave B, followed by an impulsive move in wave C. And if you recall specifically what I was thinking at the time was that this was an ending diagonal. Either way, this was not a trend-defining move. This price action here was clearly counter-trend. And so I treated it as such. And again, it was a very nice, simple move to the downside. A lot of, and again, I mean, when I go through my, my price charts, my stock charts, and I'm looking for trade setups or patterns I recognize, I usually uh, crunch through about two, maybe even 300 price charts, um, literally in just a matter of minutes, you know, no more than 10 minutes, because I know precisely what I'm looking for. I'm looking for essentially five key Elliott wave patterns, impulse waves, uh, ending diagonals, flats, corrections, and triangles, because I know what those patterns argue or, or, or suggest for the future. For example, a five-wave move. Whenever a five-wave move is complete, the next most likely move, it's going to be a move to the downside. Um, if I see an ending diagonal, well, it's an ending diagonal. It's a terminating wave. It's going to be found in the fifth wave position of an impulse wave or the wave C position of an ABC correction. I know what's going to come next. Uh, flats and zigzags and, and, and triangles, each one of those, they're counter trend patterns. So I know uh, I'll be able to rejoin the larger trend by being able to identify those successfully. Now here's a pattern, this is a nice chart here, uh, SanDisk, I think what's going on here, bigger picture, and again, this is, my, this is my own handwriting on these charts here. This is an A, B, C, D, E, I think it's a running triangle, and the reason it's a running triangle is wave B ends beyond the origin of wave A. So essentially what I'm looking at on a short-term basis is I want to see Sanders push up a little bit to a little bit above 50, maybe say 52, and then come back down, uh, say 45, 44, and actually put in a nice bottom, and then rally. That's what I'm expecting in this, uh, in this stock based off the pattern. Um, now, there's a few things about this is, number one, depending uh, – um, I don't know, I don't recall if I took the buy side here for just a quick pop, you know, five days. Uh, I did play the downside in wave E, because from 50 to below 45, that's a nice move, certainly if you're looking at options, and that's what I sometimes do. Well, look what happened here. We actually came, we, we saw the push up, we actually got above 50, and we did come down, but then there was a problem here. And the problem was, from my original forecast, based on the pattern, was for a big move to the upside. That's not what we got. We actually fell below this extreme right here. And that's a no-no. That's the wave C extreme. So whenever prices began slicing through that wave C extreme, what the wave principle allowed me to do was precisely identify when the count that I was working under was incorrect.
That's one of the most valuable things about the WAVE principle I think it does offer, and that is it lets me know precisely when I'm right and when I'm wrong. More importantly, when I'm wrong. For example, if we go back and recall some of the rules and guidelines that we spoke about with respect to impulse waves, for example, wave two may never retrace more than 100% of wave one, and then wave four may never end in the price territory of wave one. Whenever those rules are violated, it's basically saying, hey, you're wrong on your wave counter, you're wrong in your position, and you need to be proactive about managing risk. Again, something I value very, very much as a trader. Now, whenever I go speak publicly, I typically ask a lot of people, you know, do you like the wave principle? And, and you know, all the hands go up. Yeah, I love the wave principle. <clears throat> and then I ask the, another question. Do you have problems trading the wave principle? And typically everybody's hand still goes to the upside. They still, uh, they still, they, they say they do. Here's why, and it's very simple. The primary value of the wave principle is that it provides a context for market analysis. It says that in Robert Prechter's book, page one, chapter one, maybe even paragraph one. The wave principle, as it stands, is not a trading methodology. That's why people have difficulty trading the wave principle. They're using the wrong tool for the wrong job. They're trying to use a hammer to put a screw in the wall. You can do it, but it doesn't work well. So what I do with most of my work is try and take that next step with respect to making the wave principle more user-friendly to traders. And to do that, you have to understand how the wave principle actually does improve trading. Wave analysis improves trading by doing these six things. It identifies the trend. It identifies counter-trend moves within the trend. It signals the resumption of the trend the termination of the trend, and it also provides the high probability objectives. More importantly, and I just touched on this briefly, it provides specific points of ruin. And again, that's just a fancy way of saying uh, it lets you know when you're wrong. Okay, now what, I'm, what we'll be looking at, the few slides we'll be looking at next, are guidelines that I use and that I've developed to actually utilize the wave principle as a trading methodology. So number one, with respect to trading, now what you'll see here are, uh, are the, the classic, say, impulse wave, five waves up followed by the three wave decline. Here are your primary trading opportunities, wave three, wave five, wave A, and wave C. And the reason why is each one of those trades is in the direction of the larger trend. I always want the wind at my back, okay? That makes waves two, four, five, and B your setups. So within a complete eight-wave Elliott cycle, you have four primary or four ideal trading opportunities. Now, entry points, another big question. A lot of people don't know how to handle this situation. Well, <clears throat> this is what I do myself. And this is, again, these are my guidelines, and they're, they mirror essentially my trading style, which is very conservative because I, like, I don't like being wrong, and I certainly don't like losing money. So what I tend to do is I wait for the market to commit to me. My, uh, I, I like to see the market commit to me before I commit to the market. I want to see price action in the market or in a stock which is supportive of my original a analysis before I actually take a position. And this is one of the things that I do with my studies here or my, my entry points. For example, in this five wave move, in this situation here, I'm essentially looking to take a shorting opportunity. Well, when prices can get back below the wave four, wave four or five extreme, then essentially what I've got in my mind is a green light to begin looking for shorting opportunities. Same thing over here with the buying opportunities. I want to see the nice closing price action above the extreme of wave four or five before, again, I have a green light to do much of anything. Ending diagonals, I like to see the extreme of wave four give way. If we do that, I know where my protective stops are going to be. It's certainly back at the high. Now, you can be aggressive with, the, with, with, with your trading style. I'm not aggressive. And sometimes, in fact, I'll wait for the wave four to give way and actually look for a counter trend move, what well, sometimes what I refer to as the sweet spot, to actually wait for a, the larger move to the downside. The only drawback with that approach is that sometimes that counter trend move doesn't necessarily come. So, but again, there's a number of different ways to actually trade this. Getting in early, waiting for a break of the 2-4 trend line, or waiting for that, or even that secondary sweet spot. It all goes back to your own personal trading style, and mine is, again, very conservative. Zigzags, I want to see the extreme of wave B give way before I do anything. At least that gives me a green light to begin looking for opportunities, and maybe we'll see something along those lines. 
flats again very the way four a five extreme gives me the green light or gives me permission to begin looking for in this instance buy side trading opportunities because this is a counter trend move within a larger uptrending market triangles triangles can be tricky a lot of people like to be down here because they cut down on their risk and ideally maximize their uh, upside but you know, I can debate that issue quite easily. I prefer to um, uh, take a uh, increase the risk, increase the probability of success on a trade, in lieu of a smaller walk away or um, uh, more uh, less profit, if that makes any sense. If you are aggressive in this in, in this instance with respect to the triangles, I do recommend though that if you do buy down here in wave E, rather than putting your stops at the extreme if C, put them down here at A. The wave principle is very popular. A lot of people know where the stops are going to be sitting. So don't be surprised if you see prices just spike down, take out that extreme, but close high up on the day. Trade targets, Fibonacci. Uh, I see I'm kind of pushing my limit here on time, so I'm not going to touch that. But R. R. and Elliott said that the um, Fibonacci ratio was essentially the mathematical basis of the wave principle. I tend to agree. I really love uh, Fibonacci work and Fibonacci analysis, and we do a, a lot of a lot of great work in that regard uh, at ElliottWave.com. Um, before I forget, my uh, my marketing team will. Um, uh, not like me if I don't mention this. Uh, my marketing people have put together a few offers if you're interested to learn about learning more about the wave principle, learning more about commodities, learning more about how to utilize it more so as a trading tool. Because again, if you look in uh, the Robert Frechter, uh, the Frost and Prechter book, the wave principle, uh, and even going back to Elliot's original work, uh, they, there's a certain amount of absence with respect to its effect or effectiveness in a trading environment. Uh, how you analyze a price chart and how you trade the outcome can be two different things. I've always believed that analysis and trading are two separate things. But at some point, you have to make that transition. And most of the work I've been doing for essentially the last 10 years has been taking that next step with the wave principle and making it a bit more user-friendly and certainly less complicated, i.e., like, for example, boiling down the 13 patterns, i.e., down to five. So this is what I do, and let me see if I can find the um, questions um, or the dialog box to see where the questions are. I don't know how to do that. Hi, Jeffrey. It's Betty. So actually, uh, we are gathering the questions, and I'll just ask them as they come in. Okay. And everyone who's participating, this is a great time to submit your questions. So if you have one, please let us know. So. Jeffrey, the first question I have is from Joe, and he simply asked the tricky part of identifying C of a corrective wave. That's all I have for the question. Okay, uh, Joe, I'll just give you a quick uh, two things with respect to that. <clears throat> uh, number one, counter trend price action uh, tends to be contained by parallel lines. Uh, that is something I live and die by. In fact, I've I won't even, I won't well yeah. Counter trend price action tends to be contained by parallel lines. Number two, if you're looking at a zigzag, a 535 pattern, what you want to see is the slope of wave C to be shallower than what you experience in wave A. So, for example, you'll see wave A come down very sharp, come down in five waves. You definitely want to see wave C kind of take its time, unfold in five waves. And that's what will give you, say, a very noticeable divergence in your momentum indicators, such as your stochastics, your RSI, your MACD. That's one thing to do or look for with respect to zigzags. The flat, very different. You're actually going to want to see wave A kind of come down slow and shallow. Wave B go back up to the at or near the origin of wave A, and then wave C is going to be a pop. So sometimes you're not going to see that divergence in between the extremes of wave C and wave A in your momentum indicators, but if you dial down to smaller time frames, you will see the divergence between, say, wave 5 and 3 within that C wave decline. All right, excellent. Jeffrey, we have a question from Peter. Uh, I've been trading basis Elliott Wave for 14 years with good success for an exchange based on precious metals. Last nine months have been awful with stop levels taken out with great regularity. Any advice? Oh, I know exactly what you mean uh, <laughs> all too well. 
uh, if you if you trade a lot of forex, I really understand what you mean. Um, the best advice I can do, I can, or the only advice I can really give you there is um, the next time you're setting up a trade and you're looking uh, at a stop level, uh, just rem remember, step back and think to yourself, everybody else is looking at the same stop and go ahead and raise it another, say, 10, 20, 30, 40 pips. That's just going to simply have to be a consideration that you now need to take uh, whenever you put together your um, uh, make a trading decision. All right. We have two questions from Richard. Richard, I'm going to take one of these questions, which is, will the video be anywhere to watch again? And since you missed the first part, yes, we record the webinar, and it will be available uh, in a couple of days on news.cqg.com, and you'll receive an email with the link. And Jeffrey, the question for you is, where do you think we are in the S&P right now? <laughs> uh, Richard, thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> it's a little bit beyond the scope uh, of today's conversation, but uh, uh, I think the upside is limited. The thing that's really caught my eye is not the last, say, two weeks about the overall indices. It's not necessarily the um, the S and P, but I notice a, a, a very dramatic difference or a divergence between the Dow Transports and the Dow uh, Cash. And um, I'm, uh, I'm an advocate of all forms of technical analysis. I'm passionate about technical analysis. And yeah, as you know, as you probably know as well as I do, Richard, that's a classic Dow theory non-confirmation. So I'm very, very curious what's going to see uh, what's going to happen over the next, say, three, four weeks uh, in the uh, overall indices. But I'm not, I'm not too much of a fan of the upside right now because of primarily that divergence between the transports and the uh, actual Dow cash. All right, we have a question from Daniel. Hi, Jeffrey, for your entry, assuming you're buying, do you prefer to scale in as prices decline towards your sweet spot, or do you prefer to add as prices break higher through your wave levels? I like to add, uh, I like to, if I, if I see a, okay, let me, let me back up. <clears throat> um, if the trade I'm taking is more long-term oriented, Okay, because I do a lot of day trading on you know one minute price charts, that sort of thing. Um, if I'm looking for say looking to capture a three month move in something, uh, I tend to like to scale in um, like to the buy side when say prior extremes are penetrated. Um, I like to use the pullbacks as also opportunities to get in, but I tend to want to. I always try and insist on. One key thing, whether I buy pullbacks or buy breakouts to the upside, is I want to see confirming price action. On that single bar, I'm a big fan of candlestick analysis. I want to see the close at or near the high of the day. That lets me know the bull. That's that allows lets me know the bulls are in control. I want to see that. I want to see that on the daily level. I want to see that on the weekly level. I want to see good momentum. I want to see good volume. And if if I get all that. I have no problem scaling in and keeping and continuing to throw money out of position if I have the evidence which backs it up and also too that the risk reward ratio is present and that also too that I'm following my risk uh, my risk management rules. Okay, here's an interesting question from Peter. Has the growth in algorithmic system trading had or will have a detrimental effect on wave pattern formation? I don't think so. <clears throat> I, I think there's. Um, <clears throat> I think the algorithm stuff that you're talking about with the program trading, I think that has a lot to do with a lot of the stop running uh, that I, I see a bit more prevalent now than I did, say, two or three years ago, or even say five or ten years ago. Uh, but I think there are some things that are just extremely. Um, uh, not to use a bad pun, you know, there's that, that phrase, too big to fail. I think there's something out there called too big to control, uh, certainly too big to control for any length of time. And that's what's very important. And also that goes back to Dow theory as well uh, with respect to, you know, the short-term trend might be able to manipulate, uh, be, be manipulated. You know, there's some price moves I see in the currency markets where it's just like, you know, that's bogus. You know, somebody with a lot of money just came in, that sort of thing, and, and, and stepped back out with everybody else's money. But I think when you're looking at, you know, daily, excuse me, weekly, monthly, quarterly, long-term trends, 
those those types of moves, no, I, I don't think the algorithm, the computer stuff will affect that. Day-to-day -day operations with respect to, say, running stops on, you know, day traders or, or, or what I call weak money traders, yes. All right. Uh, question from Greg. CQG's Elliott Wave is largely automated. That is, you click on Elliott Wave and it fills in the wave counts. Are mm -hmm. there routine adjustments you use to standard wave counts? Um, I'm familiar with what you're um, uh, with the, Elliott, the the CQG Elliott wave uh, function. Um, all the wave counts um, that I do or I generate for my price charts or for my, my subscribers, um, they're all handwritten. It, it's what I, um, uh, I I guess I still believe I can count better than a machine. Um, and I, I would, res I, with respect to the CQG Elliott Wave function, I believe that's Tom Joseph's work. Is that correct, Betty? Yeah, I'm sorry, Jeffrey. I'm not sure, actually. Okay. Uh, I believe that may be the um, uh, Tom Joseph's, because uh, I, uh, I have played with it before. Um, the uh, Greg, I guess the, um, the answer to the question is, because I do the counting or labeling myself, I don't rely on automated software to do it. I know CQG is available in the market that do automated counting. Uh, until I find one that can count better than me, uh, I, I, I just kind of stand aside. All right. I believe that's our last question for this afternoon. Jeffrey, thanks so much. It was a great presentation. Uh, uh, Benny, thank you so much, and again, I would like to say thank you for everyone who joined us today. I really appreciate the time, and I hope you uh, uh, are. I hope I sparked an interest that, so that you would want to learn more. Absolutely. So, if you have questions, uh, you have contact information here for Elliott Wave International. You can always contact me directly, Betty D E T D E at CQG dot com. I want to thank all of you for participating today. And as I've mentioned a couple of times, we will have the recorded webinar available in a few days on our, re our real-time news site, news.cqg.com. Thank you. Betty, thank you.